Hi guys, Rod from Bensonium Thought Videos here and this is the fourth video in my series examining the underlying philosophy that gives rise to the scientific method. So currently we are working through the presuppositions or axioms that underpin the scientific method. In the first three videos we have considered coexistence, coherence, correspondence, conservation and compaction, which is also known as Occam's razor. Occam's razor can really be considered an important tool that helps us optimise scientific explanations. The final tool of science we are going to consider this week I will call calculation to maintain my summary words all beginning with C, but really is the tool of mathematics. Now mathematics is born directly out of the zeroth principle of coherence of the reasoning that controls logic itself. You might remember in our first video we considered the famous statement by Descartes, I think, therefore I am. We showed that this statement does not rely on any underlying presuppositions because it is a proof by the logic of set theory, I think, therefore I am. Descartes claims that this is the only statement that can be made which truly does not rely on any underlying presuppositions. The reason is because it is simply based on definitions and logic. We can show this by first defining existence. We define existence as anything which is and which therefore can be defined. The second definition is thought, which, for our purposes, is any mental activity including the act of defining. So it follows that thought must be a subset of existence since it can be defined. We just did it above. Now when we make or think the above statement then it follows that we do exist because we have shown that thought resides in the category of existence and so we who think must also reside there. I just use the English language to explain Descartes' famous logical statement and in many ways language itself is also built around the logic of set theory because nouns petition our external reality into identified sets. For example, the word chair defines a certain component of our reality that usually has four legs and is designed for us to sit upon. Once we put more than one object into a set, we can then start to enumerate it and once we do that, mathematics is born. In terms of how we learn maths, it all starts with children's nursery rhymes, ten green bottles, five little ducks went out one day, etc, etc. At school, all of us learn how to add, multiply, divide and subtract. For those who stay with mathematics in senior school, we learn geometry, trigonometry and calculus. Finally, those who make science their careers and specialise in either mathematics or physics, we add to this basic toolkit of vector calculus, matrices, complex numbers and advanced statistics, to name just a few areas of mathematics used by scientists and engineers. In some ways, mathematics is a bit like a vehicle that takes its driver from one piece of knowledge to another. When a child begins to learn how to count, they really are starting with the most basic form of transportation. In our analogy, we shall say a bike. This vehicle can still take you places. For example, with just basic multiplication, we can calculate the acceleration of an object given its mass and a certain force applied to it. If children's mathematics is a bike, graduate mathematics is a car. With calculus, we can calculate the velocity and acceleration of an object in an instant of time. Finally, the mathematics of Einstein and Hawkins is like a jet aircraft. With such mathematics, one can show mysterious relationships that could never be guessed, like the famous equation E equals mc squared, or e raised to pi i plus 1 equals 0. The first equation tells us that all objects that surround us can be converted into a vast amount of energy with the c in the equation being the speed of light, while the second equation tells us that raising one irrational number by the imaginary power of another irrational number equals the value minus 1. In the journey I am about to take you on over the next few thought videos, we are going to learn how E equals MC actually comes about. Now unfortunately, just as it is a lot easier to ride a bike than to drive a car, or drive a car than to fly an aeroplane, 
So the difficulty of driving our maths vehicles increases as the vehicles become more powerful. Thus, the golden rule used by most science popularizers is to avoid all mathematics. Yet sadly in doing so, most people don't realize the full weight of Einstein's famous quote, that the most incomprehensible thing about our universe is its comprehensibility. Einstein, of course, meant this in terms of how maths really does explain the inner workings of the universe. I can imagine when he made this statement, he may have even had his famous E equals MC squared equation formula in mind, as we shall see when we derive it in a later video. So how are we going to do this? Well, before we start on our mathematical journey, let's consider something that probably a lot of people can relate to much more readily than maths, and that is skiing. To become a master of snow skiing takes a lot of practice and many hard, long, and sometimes downright scary hours of work. When a person has never skied before, it is right to start them on a nursery slope while they get their feel of the skis and learn simply to stand on them. Once they have mastered that feat, the next step is to get them to slide down a very shallow slope, hopefully learning how to stop themselves with a very inelegant snowplow. With time, as their confidence and techniques improve, they progress to stem Christie's and shallow but proper ski runs, green runs. Once they have mastered parallel turns, they then begin the long progression from green to blue, blue to red, and finally red to black runs, with each colour representing an increase in steepness and slope difficulty. For those who have been skiing for many years, have good technique, and are particularly brave, the final runs are either double black or fully off-piste. Yet despite what I have described as an ordinary progression in learning to ski, what usually happens is that some poor beginner is taken up a hard red or even black run by an over-enthusiastic friend who just wants them to see the beauty of the mountain and experience the excitement of skiing down a steep slope full of moguls. Thankfully, such incidences rarely end in injury or death of the hapless beginner, but rather just a sharp argument between the beginner and said friend once they have both safely made it back to the chalet. The argument might involve the throwing of a few ski items, especially if the friend happens to be the beginner's newly married partner. The reason the beginner is able to get down the slope, which is far beyond their ability, is they simply don't ski, but rather sort of kind of fall down it, with their skis hopefully staying attached to their legs. Believe it or not, it is possible to take the same approach with difficult maths. When we get to the red runs of calculus, I am not expecting the reader to spend hours looking over the movement from one mathematical line of working to the next, although I have purposely made the steps between each line as close together as I can to make it as easy as possible to see how the maths unfolds, so the reader is not left with that uncomfortable feeling of how did he get from line 8 to line 9, as shown in the funny cartoon that some of you might have seen before. Yet just as a novice skier finds a black run hard going, a good skier will find green runs pretty uninspiring. This presents me with another difficulty, because I will start with mathematics that belongs to a green run category. This means that many of you might find what I'm about to present next as stating the bleeding obvious, in that the mathematical equivalents of green runs are the basic operations of addition, multiplication, subtraction and division. Anyone with an average ability in maths may wonder why I'm bothering to talk about such basic things as decimal notation. Can I request that you don't skip this video, for it is in these nice elementary shallow slopes that I will show you that the alignment of a mathematical system to the real world is not always as straightforward as it seems. So let's strap on our skis and begin on the nice flat green run of the four basic operands of addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. We have already discussed that these operands are learnt at a very young age. The first one we learn is addition. We learn this operation at the same time as we learn to count, and counting comes about as we first learn the concept of grouping multiple objects of the same type together. A child thinks of addition in very concrete terms. They begin with one little duck, 
then 2, then 3, then 4, and so on up to 10. Subtraction easily follows. 10 ducks minus 5 ducks equals 5 ducks. 10 ducks minus 6 ducks equals 4 ducks, and so on. Unbeknown to the child, at this point, the operands of addition and subtraction are said to be inverse functions of one another. This is because if I add a number, say n, to another number and then subtract the same number n from the result, I get back to my original number. That is, 5 plus n minus n equals 5. This slight excursion in my explanation is important because it introduces a very fundamental concept that underlies our mathematical system. Mathematics is built on logical consistency. That is, the architecture of mathematics is based on the zeroth axiom, what I call the coherency principle. Practically, this means that mathematics begins at some concrete place, like adding ducks, and then the implications of the operation are defined and the general principles extracted. This way, a very complex system is developed where all its building blocks are general principles fashioned to fit the demands of a completely coherent system. Let's return to addition and multiplication. Before I was married, I shared a house with a school teacher. One night, she was marking a little boy's work. That day in her class, they had been doing subtraction. The worksheet had the following sums on it. 10 minus 1 equals, 10 minus 2 equals, 10 minus 3 equals, all the way down to 10 minus 10. The boy had worked through all 10 equations correctly, writing the answers 9, 8, 7, etc., down to 0. However, then the boy did something very interesting. He wrote 10 minus 11 equals 0. At this point, my teacher friend wrote the comment, can you do this, question mark. I asked her why she wrote this, and her answer was simple. Oh, they are not meant to know about negative numbers yet. I thought about this for some time. It was obvious to me why the boy had written 0 and not the correct answer, minus 1. The boy had correctly understood that if he had 10 oranges and he takes away 10 of them, then he has none. However, if he has 10 oranges, he can't physically take away 11. The most he can take away is 10. Therefore, in his mind, 10 minus 11 equals 0, since 0 is the lowest real number of oranges a person can have. In one sense, the boy is correct. While negative numbers exist in mathematics, their meaning in the real world needs interpretation. Of course, it is easy to assign a real-world interpretation to a negative orange. In some ways, the negative orange is defined for us even in the equation 10 minus 1, as the right-hand term is minus 1. So what is a negative orange? Well, its effect is to reduce the number of positive oranges. In the real-world example, a negative orange may be the idea that you owe someone an orange. If you have 10 oranges, but you owe me 11, then after I have taken your 10, you are left owing me 1. When you get another set of 10 oranges, I will claim the one you owe me, leaving you with 9 remaining. In other words, in the real world example, the negative orange only has meaning once you receive more oranges. And it is at this point I can exercise my right to claim the one orange that you owe me. What about the number 0? Is that number obvious? Well, sort of. At one level, it is easy to understand it as an empty set. For example, I have zero oranges, zero chairs, or zero YouTube likes. But note what is happening here. Zero really only makes sense when it is referring to something. Is it truly possible to imagine absolutely nothing? Well, you might think it is. You might just imagine empty space. Well, I'd hate to tell you, but this is not nothing. It is empty space. For example, empty space still possesses three spatial dimensions, and indeed, modern cosmology imagines that the space of our universe expands into... what? Well, apparently, it expands into nothing, creating empty space. However, no one can define what nothing really is, if indeed it actually exists, because of the reverse logical implication of our famous Descartes statement, I think, therefore I am. You see, your own conscious existence and its thought processes mean you can't define nothing 
because you must exist to even think about the concept and so therefore true nothing is neither possible to imagine or logically experience. If you're surprised by this, take some time to think about it and you will begin to realise the limitations of our own human condition. Already there is a warning for us here. Mathematics starts in the real world. Yet quite quickly the development of a consistent numerical system results in entities which may exist in the real world once a correct interpretation is put on them, the negative number and zero being a good example. Now while it is relatively easy to align negative numbers to the real world, by the time we get to the jet fighter type of mathematics of modern physics, the alignment to the real world takes a lot of work and sometimes gives us astounding conclusions as we shall later see. Well let's continue up the mathematical mountain a little. We next come to multiplication. Multiplication starts life by adding groups of things together. If I have three oranges and I add another two sets of three to it, then I have nine oranges. All in all, this means that if I have three sets of three oranges, then in total I have nine oranges. In mathematical terms, three times three equals nine. Division quickly follows as simply the reverse or inverse process. How many sets of two oranges can I divide ten oranges into? The answer, of course, is five. Yet one can go further. If I start with one orange, I can divide it in half or I can break it into four equal pieces, which is a quarter, and so on. With these observations comes the birth of fractions. Once we have two separate operations of addition and multiplication, we then need to establish some rules of which one takes precedence in an equation over another. For example, consider the sum 4 plus 6 times 10. What does it equal? If we add first, then the answer would be 100. If we multiply first, then the answer is 64. So which is it? Well, the rule states that you multiply before you add, so the correct answer is 64. How do we indicate if the normal operation is not to be followed? We simply bracket the part of the equation we want to evaluate first. So while 4 plus 6 times 10 equals 64, open brackets 4 plus 6 close brackets times 10 equals 100. Often when using this notation, the multiplication sign is dropped, giving 10 open brackets 4 plus 6 close brackets equals 100. Another example of a general mathematical rule is the one controlling what happens when numbers are multiplied by a negative number. We start with the question of what happens when we multiply a negative number by a positive one. We can think in terms that relate back to the real world. If I owe you 6 oranges, which is minus 6, and you double the amount I owe you, minus 6 times 2, then now I owe you minus 12 oranges. No surprises there. So what is the general mathematical rule? Well, we can see that the sign of the resultant number obtained from a number multiplied by a negative number is opposite to the number that was multiplied by the negative number. In other words, the negative number changes the sign of the other number. Using this rule, one can see that multiplying two negative numbers together must give a positive number because one of the negative number changes the sign of the other negative number. It is harder to visualise a real world example of this in terms of owing oranges, but one can certainly see this at work in our use of language. The shy schoolboy who sends a valentine note to the girl he fancies may write, I really don't not love you. The effect of the double negative, don't and not, being that he really does love her. What about fractions? What happens if I divide one orange by a half? Well, this is the same as saying how many half oranges make up one orange? The answer of course is two. Likewise, one divided by one tenth is the same as saying how many tenths of an orange make up one orange? The answer of course is ten. Even with these simple rules, our mathematical system begins to give us some results which are hard to understand in terms of the real world. For example, addition and multiplication are recursive processes in that you can take any number, no matter how large, and add or multiply it by another number. Even two very large numbers can be multiplied together to give even a larger number. This means that unlike the real world, the rational number system is infinite in that there is no absolute upper or indeed lower limit. 
Furthermore, one can divide a number into any number of parts, with the denominator being also infinitely large. This means that there are an infinite number of fractions between 0 and 1, which would seem to be at odds with the real world. For example, let's take a glass that contains 18 mils of water. It is known that in this volume of water there is 6.023 times 10 to the 23 molecules and the number is now written on this screen. I'm not even going to attempt to say what that is in words, but let's just say it's a lot of water molecules. Thus, I can divide my glass of water into this many bits and no more. If I divide my glass of water into that many bits and then say, OK, let's now divide each one of these bits in half, I will not be able to do that because if I split my water molecule in half, I no longer have water. So while mathematically I can keep dividing forever, in the real world there is a limit because the real world appears to be finite. There is a special mathematical symbol given to infinity and that is the sideways 8. Infinity itself is a slippery concept. For starters, we are finite creatures living in a finite world using a finite language. Thus, when we define infinity, we are putting an unbounded concept into a finite linguistic category. The way we achieve this trick is to define infinity as the opposite of finiteness. I just did it above when I wrote the real number system is infinite in that there is no absolute upper or indeed lower limit. We have already seen how zero can be equally tricky, but let's take some time to understand it a bit more. If I add zero to another number, then that number is unchanged. What about multiplication? Well, if I multiply a number by zero, then the result is zero. This is easy to understand from the definition of multiplication. If I have several groups of 20 oranges, and I take none of them, zero times 20, then the total number of oranges I have is zero. What about division? What happens if I divide a number by zero? As we have discussed above, dividing one number by another is the same as calculating how many times the denominator of the fraction goes into the numerator. Now if the denominator is zero, then we cannot evaluate this fraction because any number multiplied by zero is zero. Thus we cannot multiply zero by any number to make it equal to the numerator, and so it is not solvable or defined. What about 0 divided by 0? Well 0 times 1 is 0, but so does 0 times 10 equals 0, and so does 0 times 100. Thus 0 divided by 0 is also undefined as all rational numbers are potential solutions. Although we take it for granted, the solution of how to code an infinite number of numbers using a finite number of characters in our number system 10 is also extremely elegant. The cleverness of the solution tends to pass us by because we learn it at such a young age. A child does not see anything special in the number 10. It is just the next number after 9. Yet unlike the 10 integers that precede it, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, this integer is not represented by a unique character, but by combining two previous characters, 0 and 1. The trick is to use the spatial position of each character to determine its numerical value. The 0 to the right of the 1 tells us that the 1 is not to be valued as 1, but as 1 times 10. As we increment this second character, we are increasing our number by factors of 10. So we have 2 times 10, equals 20, 3 times 10 equals 30, and so on until we get to Nine. 3 times 10 equals 90. If we continue adding 1 to 90, we get the numbers 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, and 99. Once we get to the number 99, we have run out of unique two-digit numbers which can be encoded by the 10 numerical characters 0 to 9. Thus, as we add 1 to 99, we create a new digit, now in the third position, 100. The digit in the third position is 10 times the number that is in the second position, which is 10 times the number in the first position. Obviously, we can continue creating new digits, each to the left of the previous digit, ad infinitum. Thus, an infinite number of integers can be coded. Let us return to our first digit, 
which codes the integers 0 to 9. We can obviously put a digit to the right of this digit. For our mathematical system to be consistent, our original unit digit must be 10 times the value of this new digit. Thus, our new digit must be 1 tenth of a unit. Just as we can add more and more digits to the left of our unit digit, so we can add more and more digits to the right of it. Each new digit to the right of the previous digit is 1 tenth of that previous digit. Because we can keep adding as many digits as we like to the right of the previous digit, it also means we can code fractions of numbers no matter how small. Yet surprisingly, this does not mean we can code every number that exists between 0 and 1, because there exist numbers whose fractional parts represent an infinite sequence of non-repeating numbers, and so cannot be fully written down. These are called irrational numbers, but we do not need to learn about these in order to develop the famous E equals MC squared equation, so they will not be considered further. It is also rather fortunate that we can write fractions off into infinity, because we have also just seen that the interval between any two integers is infinitely divisible. Yet if we can have digits to the left and right of the unit digit, how do we know which digit is the unit digit when we have a sequence of numbers? The answer is to separate the unit digit from the fractional digits with the period symbol called a decimal point. In fact, in Europe they actually use the comma. Thus, we now have a third way of writing a fraction. If we take the fraction a half, we can quickly convert it to decimal notation by multiplying both the top and bottom by 5 to get 5 tenths. We know that the first digit to the right of the decimal point is one tenth of a unit, so we can write five tenths as 0 0.5. All of us should be comfortable with decimal notation as it is the basis of our monetary system. In summary, if we have the number 1345645.456750, then we can say that this number is equal to 1 million plus 300,000 plus 40,000 plus 5,000 plus 600 plus 40 plus 5 plus 4 tenths plus 5 one hundredths plus 6 one thousandths plus 7 ten thousandths plus 5 hundred thousandths plus 4 one millionths. Very difficult to say. <laughs> anyway. We began our green run at the gentle slope of addition, which begins when children first learn to count. However, there is another starting point to mathematics, which starts with children drawing lines. If you give a very small child a pen, they will usually scribble on a piece of paper or your freshly painted wall. As their coordination improves, children will begin to draw lines on paper. Unbeknown to them, a line is a special kind of a scribble, because it is the shortest distance between two points in flat space geometry. With the intersection of two lines on a piece of paper comes the birth of an angle. Angles are something which most of us instinctively understand. In the figure next to me, I have two lines which intersect one another, creating four angles as numbered in the figure. It is possible to create circles with their centre located at the point where the lines intersect, also shown in the figure. From this figure, we can see that our four angles divide the circle into four parts. Thus, one can define the value of an angle as the proportion of the circle that is captured between the two lines as they radiate out from their intersection. Yet how do we define the number for an angle? Well, if we arbitrarily divide the circle into 360 slices, known as a degree, then the value of the angle will be how many degrees to add to make that proportion of the circle captured between the two lines. In our example, angles 2 and 3 trap an eighth of the circle, which means that the value of the angle is 45 degrees. One special intersection of two lines is when they intersect at right angles to form a cross, as shown. In this instance, the four angles created are all equal to 90 degrees. Furthermore, in this configuration, the two lines delineate two out of the three spatial dimensions that comprise our universe. Once again, we are comfortable at a young age with the idea that our universe is three-dimensional. We use terms like 
front, back, up, down and left and right to describe movement along any of these three dimensions. Yet why, or even how the universe is three dimensional, is one of those infinite regress type questions. It just is observed to be this way and so the observation itself imposes on our geometrical system as a natural consequence of our system being correspondent with reality. The important numerical property of two lines which are occupying two different spatial dimensions is that the values or positions in one of the dimensions are completely independent of the other dimension. We make use of this property when it comes to graphing relationships between two different variables as we shall see when we consider basic algebra and mathematical functions in the next video. Note, some of you might be thinking, ah yes, but isn't the universe 11 dimensional? However, this is more of a physics construction, mathematical construction, and if it is 11 dimensional, observationally, we only observe three dimensions. So the idea that the universe is only three dimensional still holds in our common experience. Okay, so that is my thought video for this week. If you like this video, please do hit the like key, and if you want to see more of my content, then please do subscribe to my channel by hitting the subscribe button and the bell notification key below. Until next time, I hope your body and mind are in a good place, and bye for now.